We're going to be looking at another time where Jesus not only mentions the Old Testament or fulfills something in the Old Testament, but he quotes a passage of scripture from the Old Testament. And kind of the title of this lesson is going to be Go Ye and Learn. Go Ye and Learn. And we're going to look into that, but we're going to overview one of the books of the prophets. We're going to take a look at the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. So if you want to turn there, you can. We're going to be flipping through different passages in Hosea. Hosea is going to be after Genesis, before Revelations in there, in the Old Testament. It's going to be immediately after the book of Daniel. So you should have your Bible about worn out in that spot. It's going to be immediately after Daniel. I'll give you a second to get there, then we'll go over a few facts about Hosea himself. Then we'll look at a few facts about the book, do a brief overview, and, and I think I hope you'll learn something, just as maybe you have all been uh, fully versed in the minor prophets and major prophets, but I have not uh, done a deep study, and this, I super enjoyed this study in the book of Hosea. So Hosea was a prophet in the northern kingdom, Israel, approximately 200 years after the 10 tribes of the northern region of Israel broke away from the southern two tribes, forming Israel and Judah. And we'll look at that map here in a second. But there is basically a kingdom split uh, that's going to be in uh, 2 Kings, I believe, is going to show us where the kingdom split. And it's split into two regions, northern and southern. They called, depending on the prophets, they'll have different names for it. But in history, if you look the kings of Israel, it'll have their own kings, and the kings of Judah, it'll have their kings. It obviously starts with King Saul, King David, then from there, David's sons cause a lot of problems, long story short, and there's the kingdom split to Israel and to Judah. So we'll look at that a little more in a little bit. The Lord would raise up Hosea to preach in the northern kingdom and compel uh, people to turn away from their sins and from their idols. So he lived in the northern kingdom. He was a prophet called by God to the northern kingdom. Potentially, and what a lot of people think and what I would lead to believe, in, particularly in the uh, tribe in the area of Ephraim. And we'll look at that in the map here in just a second. He prophesied approximately from 789 BC to 715 BC, give or take some years. That is going to be based off of the very first verse of Hosea. If you look at the very first verse of Hosea, the word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So right there it shows you, here were the kings that he served under. One was the kings of Israel, and uh, Jeroboam was the king of Judah. So right there you can see there's two distinct, even though it's technically all Israel, it's two distinct kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. So throughout the book of Hosea, he will, Hosea will call uh, the kingdoms different names, and we'll look at that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the prophet Hosea was alive during the life of Jonah, maybe just the very end of the life of Jonah. Amos, Micah, and Isaiah. I put an uh, asterisk by Amos. He was a contemporary prophet or, or prophet immediately following after Amos to Israel. There were prophets that were called to particular regions, particular, particular uh, northern or southern kingdoms. He was immediately following Amos to Israel. So here, 1 Kings, excuse me, I said 2 Kings earlier. It's 1 Kings 12 through 14. You can read that account and you'll see how Israel was divided into two kingdoms. You have your southern region, and you have your northern region. Throughout the book of Hosea, you'll see the northern kingdom, Israel, be called Ephraim or Jacob. You see Ephraim is just, just barely into the northern kingdom. And I believe, this is not scriptural, I believe this is where Hosea would, would have lived. Based on his knowledge about Ephraim, he refers to the northern kingdom as Ephraim. He could have called them any of the 12 tribes, or 10 tribes, but he specifically calls him Ephraim. And I believe, and historians also believe, that would be the region that he was from. Or he calls it Jacob, which we know is just another term for Israel. Then we have the southern kingdom, which more often than not is just referred to as Judah, or your sister, okay? Your sister kingdom, okay? 
The book of Hosea, so not the prophet, but the book of Hosea is kind of broken down into three basic portions. Throughout the book of Hosea, if you were to read it start to finish, you could summarize all the verses. Some of them are mixed in. It's not in a particular order. But it's going to talk about a marriage covenant that is broken. And we'll see that immediately in the first two verses of Hosea. We see that there is a fall and we see that there is a restoration. This is the summary of the book of Hosea. And we're going to look at each aspect. Right away, if, you, if you're in Hosea, Hosea chapter 1, verse number 2. You can basically get the whole picture of the book of Hosea, what it's going to be about here in the second verse. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. That's the whole purpose of the book. Chapters 1 through 3, you're going to see the Lord uses Hosea as a picture of God and Israel. How Israel had gone completely away from the Lord, even though, and, and the Lord mentions this many times, how he brought them out of Egypt through some very mighty, miraculous ways, how he sustained them, how he gave them kings, how he set up this huge kingdom. But within 300 years of having David the king, within 300 years you're worshiping Baal? How does that happen? And this is the book of Hosea. If you could pick one verse, what's the book of Hosea about? This. God, through the prophet Hosea, uses the circumstances in Hosea's life that he orders to show this is what Israel has done. I love Israel. Israel is my wife. I am her husband. But she has chosen to gone away from me. Okay? In 2 Kings chapter 17, which the books of the Kings and the books of the Chronicles are just history about Israel and Judah. In the 2 Kings 17, this is, this is why they, they uh, uh, fall away from the Lord's grace. And the children of Israel did secretly those things which were not right against the Lord their God. The whole time while they keep the Judaistic commandments, they keep the laws of Moses, they keep you know, all the things, the practices in Leviticus, they don't eat these things and they do eat these things and they measure everything exactly how the Lord commands but then they go worship Baal secretly. It almost doesn't even make sense, but they were keeping all the laws of God, the commandments of God, yet they were literally not even worshiping God. So in the book of Hosea, you'll read verse after verse after verse, and, and I think I'll read a few of them just so we can kind of get an idea of this aspect of a marriage covenant broken. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. If you want to flip there, you can read along. If not, if you're not there, just listen and I'll read it. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, for there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Also Hosea chapter 8, verse number 4. Uh, if you want to flip there quickly, Hosea 8, verse number 4. They have set up kings, not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and of their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. And then Hosea chapter 10, verse number 1. Israel is an empty vine. It bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. So Israel prospers, as the Lord promised they would. Did they take that prosperity and honor God with it? No. They took that prosperity and they gave sacrifices to other gods. They literally made altars to other gods out of the gold and silver that God had allowed to come into their kingdom through the hand of the Lord. So, and that was like four passages, the whole book of Hosea summer is one of these three. So you can read it for yourself, it's an awesome read. So talk, the book of Hosea talks about a marriage covenant broken. It also talks about a fall, the falling away. Hosea chapter uh, four, we'll read that one in a second, but Hosea chapter two, verse 11 through 13. Hosea chapter two, verse 11 through 13. 
This is the Lord speaking to the children of Israel. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. Wherefore, she has said, These are my rewards that my lover hath given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit, un uh, I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, where she burned incense to them. She had decked herself with earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers." And forget me, saith the Lord. Right there is, again, another, if you, if you had to pick a summary of the book of Hosea, right there. She takes the things, she as in Israel, takes the things that the Lord had given her. And these are the rewards that my lover has given to me. And then she goes after other gods. And the Lord said, you forgot me. I'm your husband. You totally abandoned me. The book of Hosea is almost like a big love letter to Israel, talking about, here's a covenant that you broke. Here's how you went away from me. And then we'll look at the restoration in just a second. Hosea 6, verse 4, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hosea 5, verse number 6, Thou shalt go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. That is an extremely sad place to be where the children of Israel, that maybe they get to a place where, you know what, we're going to go try to find God. And the Lord says, you can look, but you're not going to find me because I withdrew myself. Here, Israel is in an extremely dangerous spot. So that's the fall. They break a covenant, they fall. The Lord has to bring them to a place where he, they will be restored. We're going to pause a little bit on the summary just to give a little overview of what's going to happen. The Assyrians in about 1721, excuse me, 721, 722, so about 50 years from when Hosea begins to present the word of the Lord to the children of Israel, about 50 years after that, the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to take the northern kingdom. They are going to serve the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are going to torture them in, in, in many different ways through sieges, uh, through actual torture. The Lord is going to use the Assyrians to get Israel to a point where they realize, hey, we need to turn back. The Lord is our God. It may be too late for a lot of them, but their spirit, they may not be able to return necessarily and have Israel be returned and restored, but their hearts and their lives can be restored. So here we have the fall. Then we have restoration. Wherever you are at, wherever the children of Israel are at, God's goal is always restoration. God's goal is not, you broke my covenant, you will pay. No, God's goal is always restoration. However, he has to order your steps in your life, restoration is always the goal. Punishment and judgment is not the goal. Restoration is always the goal. That's the same here for the book of Hosea. Restoration. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the later days. Uh, Hosea 10 verse 12. Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Here's a few more verses, Hosea 2 verse 6 and 7. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, I will make a wall that she shall not find her path, and she shall follow af and she shall follow after her lovers, and she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. So the Lord's gonna order Israel's steps. He's gonna order her steps. He's gonna put up some walls, he's gonna put up some thorns. He's going to make it in a way where she's going to try to go after other gods, to go after other lovers. And eventually she's going to get to a point where she says, you know what? I've got nowhere else to go but to my, my first love, my husband, the Lord. 
Uh, Hosea 2, verse 14 and 15, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak comfortably unto her. I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor, for the door of hope. And she shall sing there, and in the days of her youth, as in the days when she had come up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord wants Israel to get back into the same spot where when he brought them out of Egypt, they were, for a short period of time, excited that they were not under bondage. They, were not, they didn't have to serve Pharaoh. If they wanted to go after other gods, that was their choice. And that's what true love is, is to be able to have a choice. But the Lord delivered them from Egypt and the Lord wanted to do the same thing. I want to be able to restore them to a point where they're just as excited as when they came out of the land of Egypt because not only did they not have to serve Pharaoh, but they could choose to serve God. Hosea 3, 3 through 5, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide with me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, for thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. There's the restoration. You're going to be totally set apart for me. I'm going to be totally set apart for you. And we'll abide together many days. Here, this verse, um, Hosea 3, verse number 5, Afterwards shall the children of Israel return, Seek the Lord their God and David their king. Is David going to be their king? David's been dead for about 200 years at this point. So how is David going to be their king? Many times in Hosea, uh, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, the prophet will use the word David being their king, but it's not David. It's Jesus Christ from David's throne. And David their king, and they shall fear the Lord in his goodness in the latter days. This is a verse talking about a promise that the Lord makes to the children of Israel about the millennial reign of Christ. How Jesus Christ will come, he will rule from David's throne in the latter days, and they'll get to be his people, and they'll get to be priests to him, and they'll get to serve David, Jesus Christ, and David's, and, uh, from David's throne. So we are not going to dive into that. Maybe in the future we will dive into that. But that's the brief summary of the book of Hosea. You have a marriage covenant that's broken. You have a fall. But then, of course, you have restoration. That was the goal. What is the message of Hosea, if we had to summarize it? The message of Hosea is Hosea 6.6. 6. Middle of the book, almost exactly in the middle of the book. Hosea 6.6. 6. So Hosea 6.6. 6. The Lord God tells them how they've gone away, tells them how they're going to fall, he tells them how he's going to restore them. The whole message of Hosea is Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Lord had given the children of Israel books of commandments, not just like, oh, here's a few commandments, books of commandments. Read the book of Leviticus if you're completely bored. There is so many different things to, to, to do and to not do and to abstain from and to, and, and to go after. Why did the Lord give Israel all of these commandments? It's because he just wanted them to, to follow a bunch of rules that he set up, and as soon as they stepped out of them, he could squash them like a bud. No. There's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons why the Lord did this, and I think in totality the reason why the Lord did this, is because he wanted the children of Israel to love him and to understand that I'm doing these things and I'm keeping you from these things. I'm not prohibiting you from these. I'm keeping you from these things because I love you. And I desire mercy, which if you were to read the book of Psalms and underline every time you see mercy, this word mercy is not talking about, well, I'm not going to punish you. I guess I'm not going to punish you. No, this mercy here in this context is talking about unconditional love. And read in that context, for I desire unconditional love, not sacrifice. And this knowledge here, this isn't talking about head knowledge, because Israel knew all about God. They knew all of the commandments. They had the books of the commandments. They knew all about God, but they didn't actually know God. So this knowledge is understanding of God. So when you read it in that sense, I desire unconditional love, not sacrifice, and understanding of God more than burnt sacrifice. The whole reason why God gave them all these commandments, did all of these things, is so that they could love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
So what is the point of sacrificing and giving burnt offerings if you don't even love God in the first place? And that's where God gets to the point, you're idol worshiping at this point. The commandments are pointless. I don't want you to do burnt offerings and sacrifices. I just want you to love me at this point. Okay, we're going to pause and we're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 9. And Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at his receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Whose house is he sitting at? He's sitting at Matthew's house. This is recorded in the other two Gospels, Mark and Luke. That's going to be in Mark, uh, Mark 2, Luke chapter 7. He's sitting at Matthew's house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Why is Jesus eating with publicans who are Jews who have sold themselves out to the Roman government to collect taxes as they oppress Jewish people. They didn't even, the, the actual Jews did not consider Jews that worked for the Roman government, they don't even consider them Jews. That's a publican, that's a traitor. You're not even a Jew. If you were an actual Jew, you wouldn't work for the Roman government. So why is Jesus eating with publicans, traitors, and sinners, people that don't keep the commandments of God. If you play the scenario out, and it's not even painting with a broad brush, Christ calls Matthew to follow him. He goes and eats at Matthew's house, as you'll see in Mark 2 and Luke 7. These people that are coming, I'm sure, are Matthew's friends, other, other tax collectors, other, other people that maybe they work for the Roman government, or, or maybe they're not even Jewish at all. Maybe they're other Romans that Matthew knew, and they're sinners, and they're eating with Christ. And the Pharisees, why is Jesus sharing a meal with these people? We'll see Jesus' answer. Verse number 12, Matthew chapter 9, verse number 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy, not sacrifice. For I am come not to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. Israel and the Pharisees, they had a lot in common. They obeyed out of obligation. It was what the law said. So they did it. They knew about God. The Pharisees knew the scriptures probably better than anybody. They honestly knew the scriptures probably better than the disciples. They knew a lot about God, but they didn't know him at all. They followed the laws of God, but they completely missed the purpose of the law. How about you? Are you doing the things that God asked you to do out of obligation? Do you go to church on Sunday because it's the right thing to do? That's what God asked us to do, so we just go to church. Are you tithing because, well, God says give 10%, so we give 10%. If I earn, you know... $100 and, and $101, I'm going to tithe $10 and one cent because that's what God said, tithe the tenth. So I'm going to tithe my mint leaves just like the Pharisees. Or out of the whole purpose of the law, the whole purpose is, you know what? 10% is not enough. I'm not going to tithe 10%. God has given me everything and far above. 10% is nothing. I want to give him everything. Do you know about God, but you don't know him? You don't understand him? The Pharisees didn't understand God. And this is what Christ was telling them. If you, if you actually, like read the whole book, this is saying, read the book of Hosea and understand what that meaneth. I desire mercy, unconditional love, not sacrifice. I don't need your money. God doesn't need your money. Michael, God doesn't want your money. He wants you because he loves you. He redeemed you. Grandma, God doesn't want your obligation. God wants you to love him. And that's what Christ is telling the Pharisees. If you knew 
God, one, you would understand that I am the Messiah. I am God. I am sent from God. And I love the sinner and the publican just as much as I love you who ties 10% of your mint leaves. If you know God, actually know God, not know about God, you'll love the things that he loves. You'll love the people that he loves. You'll want to do the things that God wants to do. You'll, you'll join in on his work. Do we follow the laws of God but miss the, perfect, the purpose? Do you love what God loves? This is an original quote to definitely not Dr. Curtis Rogers. God desires your unconditional love in a relationship with him, not your lawful obligation. I, I heard this statement at college. Well, if for any other reason than obligation, do it. That is, that is a terrible statement. If you do what God commands in his word just out of obligation, don't bother. He says, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your burnt offerings. I don't want your tithe. D Understand where I'm coming from. Don't even bother coming to church. If you're not coming to church because you love me, because you want to give your tithes, God loveth a cheerful giver, because you want to give him your tithes and your offerings, not because here goes 10% of my paycheck. Here goes another beautiful Sunday where I could be out doing yard work. No, 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 no. God desires your unconditional love and a relationship with him, not your lawful uh, obligation. So we did the learning first. We went and learned in Hosea first what, what God actually wants. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. And then Christ quotes that to the Pharisees. So I pray that the Pharisees went and they read the book of Hosea and understood. But I pray more that... We today look through the prophet Hosea, through the message that the Lord gave Israel. Hey, I want you to love me unconditionally more than I want your money, more than I want your sacrifice, your time. I want you because <laughs> you're my wife and I love you and I gave myself for you. I'm your redeemer and, I, and I've called you to myself. So love the Lord, not because you have to, not because it's your lawful obligation, but because you love him unconditionally like he loves us. That is our lesson for today. I hope you learned something, and I hope the Lord is working in your heart and life.